Hi everyone, Ben Roth here with a little bit of top of the show business. Um, really, I just want to say I meant for this to come out last week, but I had some technical difficulties, which I talk about a little bit on the show, and so it's coming out now. Um, I mentioned in the show that the first episode of Season 2 is probably going to be launching next Tuesday, the 8th. That is still my goal. I don't know for sure if I can get it done, but we're going to try. <laughs> and then we're going to go for uh, every two weeks after that, like we were before. This was a special bonus episode. It is a tribute to two of my favorite podcasters, um, Chris LaHoff Hoffman and Pete Burley Red Yeti Mashad, who are two former Nintendo Power employees and who were the co-hosts of the Power Pros podcast, which was one of the many things that got me through my commute while it was on the air. And disclaimer, I did realize that a couple of times during recording, I said episode when I really meant issue, and I said composed when I really meant produced. Welcome to the world of speed editing. <laughs> anyway, oh, last thing. Um, as of the day that this goes up, there is going to be a poll that I'm going to post, and I'll have it up for a couple of weeks where you guys can vote for some of the topics that we have this season. This is a sort of teaser. Um, after we get a few patrons, this is going to be kind of a patron-only thing where people get to vote for episodes that we do. But uh, for this first um, season when we actually have a Patreon, uh, I wanted to kind of give you all a taste of what that would be like. Um, for those who have already pledged their support, we appreciate you very much, and as, uh, you know, the rest of you, if you're able to, we, um, you know, love any support that you can throw our way, but who am I kidding? Y'all have been supporting us all along, just by listening, and especially by commenting and writing things in. We love and appreciate you all so much, and I think that's about it. Before I start tearing up, let's get into it. Greetings, gamers. I'm Bed Roth. And I'm Shoot the Bow. And you're listening to the second bonus episode of Very Good Music, a VGM podcast. So, this episode is going to be a little bit different, and it's kind of a special one. Power Pro's podcast was kind of a continuation, unofficially, of the feeling of the Nintendo Power magazine that ran from the early 90s all the way up through... December of 2012, when the final issue was released. Have I ever told you anything about Nintendo Power? Um, not much. Hmm. Let me go grab something for you. <clears throat> Nintendo Power was a magazine that meant a lot to me. Growing up, um, you know, we had an NES, and that was it. Then we got a Super NES. I also got a Genesis, but Nintendo was really always kind of the most special to me. But I remember from when I was really, really young, um, I had a Nintendo Power subscription. And I had it pretty much most of the way, if not all the way, through high school, which I graduated in 2001. Um, I didn't have the very first episode, or one that's kind of notorious because... Uh, it was Castlevania, and Simon had Dracula's severed head on the cover. And this was supposed to be a magazine aimed at kids who play Nintendo games. <laughs> so, um, I've heard uh, the guys on Power Pros talked about that a couple of times. But, um, I think the first one that I had was a cover that featured Mega Man 3. Um, you know, interestingly, since we just talked about that on the last episode. Anyway, then I kind of fell away from it for a while, but then Mom got me another subscription shortly after you were born, uh, when we moved to this house. I had it for a little bit, and then I let that one expire, but any time I was, you know, at a store or something, I would at least, uh, you know, pick it up and kind of check it out. And I actually started, um, toward the end of the, the run, I started seeing there was a little section in the listener letters column at the beginning of the magazine called uh, Don't Hassle the Hoff, where like the Hoff would answer a question. And it's funny because toward the uh, 
in the last like season or two of Power Pros, um, Pete, uh, the the co-host, would um, ask. He kind of invented this pre-break little segment that he called Hassel the Hoff, and he would ask video game professor Hoffman a question. So I kind of got to know Hoff through that, and I knew Chris Slate as well, um, who was Hoff's uh, first co-host on uh, Power Pros, and um, after that left and started officially working for Nintendo of America, and is now the host of the Nintendo Power Podcast which is pretty good. Uh, I think it comes out once a month, so it's not too frequent, but uh, it's actually kind of like Nintendo Power for the modern age. But I had not thought of Nintendo Power for a while, and then in Walmart one day, I saw this. That cover is cool, because the very first cover of Nintendo Power looked like that for Mario 2. So this is like an updated version. And... Then I saw that on the spine. What does that say? Final issue. Yeah. I had no warning. And it was sad. I picked it up and I just walked over and I put it in the basket. And your mom was like, what's that? And I just held it up and showed her the words. And she rolled her eyes because, you know, she just didn't get the nostalgia. Um... Take a look at this final comic. It's also not going to mean as much to you, but there's a character in Nintendo Power who is in several little comic shorts called Nestor. He actually got his own video game on the Virtual Boy, of all things, called Nestor's Funky Bowling. But he was a kid who, um, you know, played Nintendo games. That's a good way. <laughs> I wish you'd be Nintendo Power at that time. <laughs> you wish I'd read you Nintendo Power at that time. <laughs> Indeed. So, that'll bring a tear to your eye. It was, it was special to me. This episode's also really cool because it lists... It's episode, uh... 285. And so it lists the 285 greatest games ever to grace Nintendo consoles. <laughs> the top five were Super Mario World, Final Fantasy III, Super Mario Galaxy... Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, and number one, what do you think? Super Mario Bros. Nope. Ocarina of Time? Yep. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yep. You you just, you can't understand how big of a deal that game was to my generation. And most of these guys who were the Nintendo Power Riders were in, like, they were on the older side of my generation. Whereas I'm kind of on the youngest side, I'm like right on that edge between uh, Gen X and Millennial. In a lot of ways, I kind of identify with the Gen Xers, but um, video games, especially Nintendo games, are one of those, I think. I'm solidly in the classic camp. And so, shortly after I got my first iPod, I was just kind of looking around for different podcasts, and when I searched video game podcasts, I stumbled across Power Pros who at that point were less than 10 episodes in, when I saw that it was hosted by two former Nintendo Power editors, I was immediately like, yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> this is my, my show. I'm going to listen to this every week. And I did. And it was really good. The one longest running host was Chris Hoffman, known as The Hoff. And uh, he started out with Chris Slate, who, like I said, had was another former NP editor. And, um... Later on, Chris left to go work for Nintendo, and uh, Scott Michella joined for a while, uh, who is another friend of Chris's, and he's had several uh, co-hosts over the years who kind of, like, filled in periodically when he needed them to. Scott was the second uh, main co-host, though. But finally, the third, um, and I think maybe longest-running co-host... I'd have to go back and count the episodes to be sure, but he was on there for quite a while, was uh, Pete Michaud, um, uh, who I think is called Burly Red Yeti on Twitter. <laughs> um, and Pete and Chris have a really great dynamic. They're both just these, you know, goofy guys who love games and know their stuff when they're talking about them. They're a little bit older than I am. Um, I don't know exactly how much older, but just a little bit. And they have a kind of a fun history. Um, 
I'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, because we're actually going to mention the game that is sort of the most infamous uh, when it comes to their like shared history together, and it's a story I think that you'll appreciate. The penultimate episode of the Power Pros podcast. Oh, I guess I should say that's the main reason that I'm doing this episode is because Power Pros podcast ended this summer with episode 200 and. Their final episode was great, so they talked about their favorite video game endings, and Hoff said they may come back periodically for special episodes, but um, I guess they just felt like, you know, it was time to um, end the show and move on. Around that time, I also lost my commute because of the coronavirus outbreak, and so, um, you know, one less podcast to have to follow every week, especially when I've been trying to get into so many video game music podcasts. It didn't hit me as hard, maybe, as Nintendo Power did, and I am still in touch with Hoff through email because he's a really cool guy. That's one of the coolest things about having been a fan of this show is being able to connect with somebody who I had so much respect for. And um, Hoff, if you are listening to this, I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope it uh, just brings a smile to your face and gives you at least part of the, you know, that just sort of warm feeling of good gamers being good gamers to each other that um, reading Nintendo Power and listening to Power Pros gave to me. Shuka Pao is also with me. He's probably going to talk even uh, less on this episode <laughs> because, um, you know, this was kind of my nostalgia baby. But after each song, we are going to get a little bit of his uh, feedback on kind of what he felt about it. But I'm not going to ramble that much between the songs. The penultimate episode of Power Pros was one where uh, the guys each listed their top ten favorite video game soundtracks. They played a song from each soundtrack, and um, you know it was a really it was a good show. It was almost like if Power Pros were a VGM podcast, what would it be like? And I decided that for this bonus episode, for one thing, there are twenty tracks, which is why we're not going to talk as much in between. Mm-hmm. But for another, I thought it would be fun to talk about some of the songs they mentioned but didn't play, or if they didn't really mention any other songs, I would just. Uh, you know, pick a song that I really like from the game. And these are the songs I ended up coming up with. The opening that you heard was a slightly longer version of the opening um, of uh, the Power Pros theme song. Uh, It's called Shark Flower. It's from the 2013 album 13 Orphans, which was written by Andy Myers, also known as Stenobot. And Myers is one of uh, Hoff's former co-workers at Nintendo Power, so I thought that was kind of a cool connection. And it's a it's a fun little tune, Jugabao. I think the word that you described you used to describe it was what? Um, I don't know. I think it was interesting. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the songs. The first one, funnily enough, is called "Ending." <laughs> <laughs> it is from the Super NES classic Act Racer, uh... and I'll go into a little more detail when we come back.
welcome back, gamers. Once again, that was ending from Act Razor, composed by the wonderful Yuzo Koshiro, developed by Quintet, published by Enix before they merged with Square. This came out on the SNES in 1990. The Hoff mentioned that the ending theme sounds really cinematic. Shukapau, do you agree? Yep. I agree as well. <laughs> I'm not going to say which songs the guys played from these games, because I really encourage you guys to all uh, go seek out that episode of Power Pros. There are really a lot of great episodes. I mean, 200 episodes, there's way too much. I'm not going to you know, ask any of y'all to go out and listen to all of them, but look through the library and uh, pick and choose the ones that look like they're interesting, because if they look interesting to you, they probably will be. Um... Shukapau, any quick thoughts about this one? Anything stand out to you? Instrument-wise, did it remind you of anything? I mean... Did it stir any feelings in you? It is very... Um... Square. I... Square Phoenix. <laughs> Not square like you're a kid from 20 years ago calling something uncool. <laughs> that was the thing. Yeah, yeah. If you were not cool, then you were square. <laughs> that was before my time, even. Um... But yeah, this, uh, I mean, it sounds cinematic. That opening totally sounds like 20th Century Fox, <laughs> like the movie opening. Um, but yeah, it was it was fitting because Act Racer was a really cinematic game. And it's great. Lots been said about it, so I'm not going to say any more. Instead, we're going to move on to game number two. Uh, Act Racer was one of Hoff's uh, favorites. It was the first one that he mentioned. This one was Pete's first game of the show. He said the whole soundtrack is great. I agree. And this song is my personal favorite from this game. From the NES classic Contra. This is Bass. Oh man, this song is so good. Like, it, it's it's really simple. It's got kind of a short loop. Um, not as short as it sounds, though, because the second time around it actually like adds the drum in, and there's like so it's got an A B A C structure to it, and it just it, it works really well. Um, this level is really weird. Have you seen me play Contra before? Uh, no. Okay, so the first level is just a standard kind of side scrolling run and gun stage. In the second one, it's faux 3D, which when I was younger looked really cool. Now that I'm older, I see that you're just kind of like walking up this, you know, the Y axis, and it doesn't really look like you're walking into the screen. Um, kind of, if you kind of suspend disbelief a little bit, mostly it looks kind of like just janky old graphics, but it's still so fun. Um, in Contra, do you know like how, to, how you get power-ups? No. Usually, there's these little, like, floating capsule things that go through the sky, and you shoot them. Do you know what the most famous power-up from Contra is? PK-5. It's a type of gun. Is it a shotgun? It's called the spread gun. And, like, five different, like, blasts of fire come out, and it basically covers the entire screen in front of you. And it's really, really cool. In the base stage, the way that you get special weapons... Well, there's like these guys are running across the screen um, that you're shooting toward in the background. And then there's this one red guy that just kind of jumps across the screen. Like, boop, boop, boop. And when he jumps, his legs go like this. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so derpy nowadays, but when you shoot him, you uh, he explodes, of course, and then you get um, a special weapon. But... This song, <laughs> this song plays twice uh, in the game. What did you think of it? It's it, it sounds good. I, I like it. 
it's it has sort of that like frantic feel, which I feel sort of is good for I don't know Contra. Yep, that type of game. I mean, you're like running through jungles and fighting aliens, so I think frantic yeah. is probably a nice nice word for it. Cool. Well, I think you will have something to say about this next one. Hoff's second song that he mentioned, or the second game that he mentioned, was Chrono Trigger. Um, like I said, I'm not going to say which theme he played. It was a character theme. And Hoff mentioned that he likes the rousing character themes in this game. I am inclined to agree. As much as I love the entire soundtrack, the songs that are associated with a character, whether it's one of the playable characters or even a secondary character like um, Scala or Shala's theme, uh, is a pretty famous one. Um, this one, though, is your personal favorite of the character themes. I'm not talking about Frog's theme, which we've already played on this show. Which theme am I talking about, Shoot Kapow? All right, Ayla's theme. Here we go. As we have mentioned before on the show, published in 1995 by Square for the SNES and composed by Yasunori Mitsuda, that was Ayla's theme from Chrono Trigger. Tell us why you love this theme, Shukba. This... Okay. So this is a theme that really... Okay. So in Chrono Trigger, basically you go around the timeline and you go to different places. And eventually, after trying to beat up Magus and succeeding, and then also failing somehow, <laughs> you yeah, that is end up in one of the best like thing. twists in video games. Sixty-five million BC. Yes, I think so. And you go over to this village, and the cave villager people show you to their chief, who is Ava. Yep. And you have a drinking contest. <laughs> and this theme just fits Zayla so well. Yeah. Because she's just like this big, brave, wild, like, force of nature. And the song with, like, the rousing horns and the driving drums. Yep. just. But it's a it's a happy song. Like, it's a joyful song. It's not just, like, this angry battle song. And yep. that's also Ayla. Because she's just having fun, you know? Yep. Ah, so Running good. around time and eating up aliens. So this was this was either made by Square just before or just after they merged with Enix. So this is kind of sort of technically the second Square Enix game of the night. We've also had a Konami game. We haven't had any Nintendo yet. Um, all of the games on the list tonight were on Nintendo systems, but um, not all of them were of course first party games. The next one, though, is from Pete, uh, his second pick of the episode. This is F-Zero X, and I could have picked any number of the sort of remixes on this track. Um, they redid, like, Mute City and Big Blue and some of the other, like, really famous F-Zero tunes. But my favorite thing about this soundtrack is the song titles. <laughs> 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 like it's it's just so great, and I I'd never played F Zero X, um, and so I didn't know about this until we played Smash. But seriously, you guys, just look up the soundtrack for F Zero X. For example, the theme that we are playing from Red Canyon, the Red Canyon stage rather, is called "The Long Distance of Murder," <laughs> and here we go.
bringing the heat with Pete, <laughs> who uh, mentioned F Zero X as his uh, second game of the night on the Power Pros top ten top ten soundtracks episode. This was the Long Distance of Murder, the Red Canyon theme from F Zero X. This game was composed by Taro Bondo and Hajime Wakai. It was composed by Nintendo, the first first-party game of the night, and was released for the N64 in 1998. So, we've had NES, we've had SNES, and now we have had N64. So Pete mentioned that he really likes the guitar on this OST. This kind of sounds like it could be a Capcom game, like a Mega Man X, or like a Falcom JDK game which you haven't heard a whole lot of, but you will. I need to expose you to some of that. Did you like this song? Yeah, it was um, it was very good. <laughs> if you liked this song, you will like the Falcom JDK stuff. But the guitar on this is, it is superior to the Mega Man X guitar. Like, I mean, it's N64, so it's slightly better sound chip. But I thought that this song really let the guitar shine. But then listening to it this time, also the drums just really jumped out at me. The song rocks. Like, ah, it's so good. And we're not going to go too far from that rock feel, although we are going to go back in time a little bit to more chiptune from the NES port of the arcade classic Double Dragon. This is the opening level, also called Billy and Jimmy Lee's Theme. Yeah, the last like 10 to 15 seconds of that loop just rock out. <laughs> oh, the first part of it, I mean, this is a classic theme. Like, a lot of people will recognize that, especially from my generation. I didn't play as many beat em ups as a lot of guys my age because I was an only child. Um, when I got a little older, I did play more on the SNES with my friends, but um, didn't play lots of uh, games like this. But Double Dragon just, I mean, it's a classic. I'm actually kind of surprised that either Billy or Jimmy hasn't been in Smash yet, but... It sounds like if if Mega Man X was on the NES, <laughs> because it's, it's got that Mega Man X feel, like... The guitar know, is a lot yeah, of it, yeah. Like, like some of my new soundtrack stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah! Man, I wonder if my new soundtrack ever did a cover of this song. I should look that up, because he could totally do this justice. Or Skeletroid, too, with the thrash. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, this is so good. So Hoff said that the title theme and the opening level have a lot of excitement and a lot of punch to them. Pun intended. <laughs> Double Dragon was released for the NES in 1987 in Japan and in 1988 in North America. It was developed by Technos Japan and published by Taito for the arcade. And yeah, not too much else to say about it. So. We shall move on to Pete's third track, which is another uh, pri uh, prime, <laughs> another first party NES title from another system that we have not visited yet. And I kind of let it slip already. This is Metroid Prime. And 
I don't have a great deal of nostalgia for this game either. I actually missed a lot of the Metroid Mania when I was growing up. I was all about Mario and Kirby and especially Legend of Zelda, but I kind of missed out on Metroid a little bit. But I cannot deny, this game is fantastic. The music is also fantastic. Um, I think that this is possibly the Super Mercado Bros. like, shared favorite game. Like, game. And they've talked about the music at length and said some really great things about it. Pete says that Prime 1 in particular did a great job of taking the classic tunes and modernizing them. So, I wanted to find one of those uh, modernized classics. So I went with Talon Overworld, which is a remix of the NES classic Brinstar. And one of the longest songs on our playlist tonight, that was Talon Overworld from Metroid Prime. Composed by Hirokazu Tanaka for the NES, uh, for the Brinstar theme. 
and arranged for the GameCube by Kenji Yamamoto and Koichi Kuyama. This was developed by Retro Studios, uh, their first outing, I believe, for Nintendo, by whom this was published, because Samus is their character. <laughs> and like I said, it was released for the GameCube in 2002. This is a true modern classic. And what was the word that you used to describe this song, Sheep, huh? Um, creepy. <laughs> and then slightly <laughs> less creepy. <laughs> for the first half, it definitely was. But then after that uh, minute 30 mark, um, when you start to hear the Brinstar theme, with that sort of ethereal choir singing it, then it starts to break into this almost hopeful theme. And I wish that I had played the game so I could be reminded of what this, what this section is like. Um, regardless, though, just like everything else we're playing tonight, Shukapow, this is what? Very good music. <laughs> but let's come out of the dark a little bit and climb up on some bright, sunshiny, if also cold, snowy, and somewhat treacherous mountains. We're going to go and visit the Himalayas, because for Hoff's fourth game of the night, he brought to the table DuckTales. Ooh. For the NES. <laughs> uh, Disney Capcom classic. Of course, the moon theme is pretty much universally recognized as an all-time great, uh, bursting with fun and energy in Hoff's words, but the other tunes should also be not overlooked. And this one is one that he mentioned but did not play on their episode. From the NES game DuckTales, this is Himalayas. Between this and Double Dragon, some of those really, really high NES guitars are starting to uh, give this old man a little bit of a headache. <laughs> I love the music, and I grew up with it, and it's so nostalgic for me, but yeah, I, I mean, there's still something so sweet and crunchy about that sound, but yeah, a lot can, a little can go a long way, I will say. Um, so the last song, you described in one word as creepy. What was the one word you used to describe this song? Fun. <laughs> and yeah, it definitely is, which the whole game is. It's, ah, oh, it's, this game is so good. Like, a lot of, um, licensed titles on the NES were just really hot garbage. Um, Disney, especially on their Disney Afternoon games, did a pretty decent job. They were all at least okay, and, uh, this one, though, was just, it was a really good, really solid platformer. And the music, of course, is fantastic. Composed by... Hiroshige Tonomura, who didn't do a ton of other stuff that I have ever been able to find. This game came out in 1989 in Japan and 1990 in the U.S., and it is just flippin' fantastic. This will not be the last time we feature DuckTales on this show. That particular song, there were parts of it, especially when the guitar came in, that actually kind of reminded me a little bit of Maniac Mansion. The... Um, like David Warhol, George Singer, NES version that's got some also really, really great, really rocking tunes. But the guys did not bring Maniac Mansion to their podcast, so I will not talk about it anymore for this episode. Let me see. So Actraiser, Contra, Chrono Trigger, F-Zero X, Double Dragon, Metroid Prime, DuckTales, Pete's fourth track is yet another Nintendo classic, and I think most of Pete's remaining tracks are from first-party games. He's a man after my own heart. Um, the next one is from one of my favorite games of all time, from my favorite series of all time. And it's not the first track I probably would have picked from this game, 
but it is a really great one. Um, from The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. This is Black Mist. A classic and a soundtrack full of classics. And I said that this would not have been my first uh, track to pick, but a lot of that's because you already picked um, the regular uh, Dark Golden Land theme. Um, and there are other songs that I actually have future plans for, which is why I couldn't pick them yet. But yeah, Black Mist, it's a great one. Uh, this is the song that plays in on Death Mountain in the Dark World and in the Lost Woods in the Dark World. I believe that Smash actually terms this song Hidden Mountain and Forest, and either way, it's just a great song. Now, I know you've heard this before. What do you have to say about it? I mean, not much. Zelda music is just good, and this fits. It's, it's good Zelda music. This is the first of four times that Koji Kondo is going to appear on tonight's show. Because <laughs> Koji Kondo. Because Koji Kondo. Uh, even though we've played, um, well, I was going to say we played surprisingly little. I guess we it's only surprising because you know, he is such a big deal and we love him so much. But yeah, he's going to be on this one four times. So settle in, all of you Nintendo fans. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past was released on the SNES published by Nintendo in 1991 in Japan and 1992 in North America. All Zelda games have great soundtracks. But, according to Pete, A Link to the Past has something special. Pete, I could not agree more. And from one Super NES classic, we go to another one. I mentioned that I was going to share a story uh, between uh, you know, Pete and Hoff that sort of became a running joke on the show, and it's, it's infamous in their sort of history together as co-workers. Back when they were working together at Nintendo Power, Hoff had a copy of Final Fantasy VI, uh, which of course was released on the SNES as Final Fantasy III. And he had gotten either... He'd either beaten it or was almost to the end. And then he let Pete borrow it. And Pete, he says accidentally, erased Hoff's file. Because, of course. <laughs> and from that day forward, they were, as they always like to call each other on the show, nemeses. <laughs> <laughs> but they had a really, really great chemistry for, uh, for all that. And Hoff's fifth pick of the night, as we approach the halfway point of our show, came from Final Fantasy VI. And the name of the song, composed, of course, by the talented and just... Words can't begin to describe this guy's uh, impact on the scene, kind of like Koji Kondo. The famed Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu. The name of the song is Epitaph.
And we're back. So, Chukapow, you and I were talking a little bit. Um, you know, don't feel like you have to go super in-depth or anything, or, you know, you don't have to sound like an, a professional music commentator. What do you think about it? Well, it's very, it's very emotional. It, um... I mean, right now in Final Fantasy IV, I'm in sort of this peaceful village called Tor- uh, Tororia. It's it's very nice, and uh, it'd be interesting listening to the Final Fantasy III epitaph theme while you're in a nice peaceful village in Final Fantasy II. <laughs> That's fun. You've been getting into Final Fantasy lately. Uh, you've got aspirations to play some of the other games now. And I think that's cool. I have played some Final Fantasy over the years. I got about halfway through this game, uh, Final Fantasy VI, on the SNES Classic when we first got it, and I had never played it when I was younger. I'd I'd seen some playthroughs of it, I'd watched other people play it, I know of its import, um, but I was too busy with Link to the Past, I guess. And you know what's funny? You and I were talking the other day about Link to the Past and Final Fantasy, and... We were saying something, like, we were comparing them some. Oh, we were comparing the games and, like, what each one would be. And how, like, Final Fantasy VI is kind of like a link to the past in as far as, like, where it stands in the series. Final Fantasy VII is, like, Ocarina of Time. And then some of the later games that are still great, like Final Fantasy IX, I compared to Wind Waker. Eight was Majora's Mask. You were like, so what would Final Fantasy II be? And I said, I don't know. Uh, you said, oh, maybe Link's Awakening. <laughs> so, but then we talked about how and I forget what podcast I heard this on, but how there were some similarities between Koji Kondo's work in Link to the Past and Nobuo Uematsu's work in Final Fantasy VI. This is one of those, because the emotion I would pin on this song is melancholy, which is kind of a thoughtful sadness. Um, not complete sadness, but just kind of right there teetering on the edge of sadness, where you're not quite sure if you're sad or not. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's melancholy. And um, it's sort of a wistfulness, uh, but with a tinge of, of sorrow in there. And it reminds me a lot of the staff role from A Link to the Past. Mm-hmm. And either way, it's very, very good. Good job, Hoff. And this was the first game that actually made the Hoff go out and buy the soundtrack. Uh, he didn't play this on his show, of course, because I'm not playing any of their songs, but he mentioned that this was one of his favorites, so that's why I went with it for the show. The next one is another one where I picked this song because it's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, Pete did not mention this song on the show. Um, I think that they might have played... Did they play the most famous song? I don't know. There are a lot of famous songs from this theme, because it's another Zelda game. (laughs) This is The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker released on the GameCube in 2002 in Japan, 2003 in North America, published, of course, by Nintendo, Pete's fifth pick of the night and our halfway point for the evening. The song that I chose to show from this game is Grandma. Thank you. 
And with a little more melancholy for you tonight, that was Grandma's theme from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Shukupa and I were trying to remember where this is in the game. Um, and I think it's after your sister Errol gets abducted by the Halmarok bird, and Grandma is giving you your gear that was passed down from generation to generation. It's dangerous to go alone and take this. <laughs> and uh, this is so good. Um, a little podcasting memory I have of this is recently on the Rock Out With Your Heart Out, Rock Out With Your Card Out podcast. Uh, Jason Ariola was talking about how his grandma bought him a lot of the games that he loved when he was a kid, and she was very special to him, and that his song always brings a tear to his eye because um, of his memories of her, and I thought that was really sweet. That may have been why it occurred to me to play tonight. The Wind Waker was composed by Kenta Nagata, Hajime Wakai, and Toru Minagishi, with some contribution and, of course, a lot of rearrangements by themes written by Koji Kondo. And I don't know which of these gentlemen wrote this particular theme, but it's very good. Moving away from Zelda and from Nintendo First Parties once again to a game that I actually have zero experience with. Unlike all the other games on the playlist tonight. Um, no, there is one more that I also have zero experience with. But most of these other games I have at least played a little bit of. I don't know that I have ever played a game in the Gradius series, or Gradius, or Gradius, or whatever, however you pronounce it. I don't even know, because I haven't played it. But Gradius is one of the quintessential horizontal scrolling shoot 'em ups and maybe that's why I haven't played it. I don't love that style of game, because it, my just reflexes are not great, but this soundtrack is really, really, really good. <laughs> um, I listened to almost the whole thing when I was trying to pick a song, and um, it's the soundtrack I was the least familiar with as I made my picks for the episode. I really enjoyed exploring the OSC. There were a lot of really fun and intense tracks. This one stood out to me, because it is the most chill continue theme I have ever heard. <laughs> so, let us continue with Continue from Radius 3. Not really melancholy, but still kind of another slow, thoughtful tomb. I almost tomb <laughs> tune. I almost want to peg this for something like a like a credits theme or something like that, but not for a continue theme. It's really good though. It's a short loop, which is fitting for continue. If you want to hear uh, more continue music, the guys from XBGM Radio actually did this fairly recently. Had some really cool stuff to say about the whole concept and some of the songs they played. All that I will say, however, is um, Konami, according to Hoff, made some of the best music back in the day, but the Gradius titles stand out to him. Gradius 3, he says, has an 80s synth sound, but is also epic, energizing, and uplifting. And I think that this song definitely has that uplifting feel. Gradius 3 was composed by Miki Higashino, and it was published by Konami for the Arcade in 1989, and the SNES in 1990 for Japan and 1991 for North America. Do you have any comments on this one, Shukapal? Hmm. This one, it's... It's definitely very chill, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, it sort of sounds like Earthbound music. Yeah, I could hear that. Some of the more, like, emotional parts of Earthbound. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, the next song, which is Pete's sixth pick of the night, is yet another Stone Cold classic. And it is our second tune of the evening, 
by Koji Kondo. From another game in my favorite series, The Legend of Zelda, this is not the version that is my favorite, but there is a version of this song that is my favorite video game music related piece, like ever. Do you know what song I'm talking about? No. <laughs> From The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, this is Gerudo Valley. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Classic among classics, that was the Gerudo Valley theme from Ocarina of Time, and oh, it's just so good. It's so good. Um, I could go on about this forever. I'm not going to. It's just a fantastic song, and there are so many great covers of it, because like all of Koji Kondo's arrangements, it lends itself to reimagination, reorchestration, and it's just, it's just wonderful. What do you have to say about this song? Well, I mean... I grew up hearing this quite a bit, so <laughs> yeah, definitely a classic in my eyes. <laughs> well, so this is Pete's final Zelda choice. He says the soundtrack tells as epic a story as the game itself. I'm really glad that they brought this game to their episode, even though he and Hoff pronounce it Ocarina <laughs> instead of Ocarina. <laughs> um, Pete mentions that he can hear this song in his sleep. <laughs> so it's a favorite of his too, even though it's not the one he picked for the show. Um, I am also really partial on this soundtrack to The Song of Storms. It's probably my favorite ocarina song, but there's just a lot of really, really fantastic music in this game. I mean, if you're going to feature a musical instrument in the title of your game, you should probably make sure the music is pretty good. And if you want good music in a game, Koji Kondo is not the worst man to hire. <laughs> so this is the second game, the one we're coming up on, uh, Hoff's seventh pick of the night. The second game that I have zero personal experience with. I do have some experience with this series, and it is a lot of fun. In Japan, the series is called Ganbare Goemon. Do you know what this series is called in America? Nope. The Legend of the Mystical Ninja. The Mystical Ninja's name is Goemon. This particular game in Japan, which is the place where it originally came out, is Yukihime Kyushutsu Imaki. The name of the song is Town of Yamato. Wasn't this guy a me costume in Smash? Thank you. 
that happy, bouncy little number was Town of Yamato from Ganbare Goemon, Yukihime Kyushutsu Imaki. This was, <laughs> this was composed by Kazuhiko Uehara, who I have said before and we'll hear more from, and Harume Ueko. It was composed by, once again, Konami, sensing a trend here from Hoff, <laughs> for the SNES in 1991 in Japan and 1992 in America as The Legend of the Mystical Ninja. This is a really, really fun game. Um, I have seen it played before, and I think, like I said, I've played something in the series, and it just looks like a ton of fun. The writing is great, the characters are really cool, the sprite work is beautiful, the music is fantastic. Hoff says this is yet another Konami great, set apart by the way it incorporates Japanese instrumentation, which you noticed, and rhythms, with modern sensibilities. I thought this track was a good example of that, which is why I picked it. It's another one where I went through most of the OST until I really wanted to find something I thought would fit what they had to say about it. Um, yeah, when the, the first when I asked you what was the first thing you thought of, you said it's got that sort of eastern sound to it. And yeah, that flute, especially with those trills, do, 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 you know, that was got that eastern feel and uh, the eastern scale going on there. But that bass line was definitely very kind of that, that modern sensibility that Hop was talking about. And back to Pete. For his seventh pick of the night, we have yet another First Party Nintendo Classic. Although this was actually a sort of reimagining and rebuild from the ground up classic. It's also our first game of the night from the Wii, and I believe the most modern game on this list. These guys are definitely old school. Yeah, confirming that now, this is the most modern game on the list. It also has a very, very, very long list of composers and arrangers, which I'll get to after we play the song. You will recognize this tune as you will recognize the title of it. The title is Minor Circuit, and the game is Punch, Punch Out. Out. Son, I have to let you lead that in because I know that you love this game in Smash. What or this what? song in Smash? <laughs> what do you think? What are your thoughts? Comments? Trumpet. <laughs> Very much so. Oh, this this is like Little Max theme in Smash. It's it's so good, and it's so similar to. I mean, it, it's just a remix of the original Minor Circuit theme, but. This is one of those that just, in my mind, it takes that and makes it what it could have been if the composers back then had had the, a chance to realize it like this. It's just so good. The instrumentation is great. The arrangement is fantastic. Punch Out for the Wii was released in 2009. It was developed by Next Level Games, of course, composed by Nintendo. The composers for this track were Yukio Kaneoka, Akito Nakatsuka, and Kenji Yamamoto on the NES original. But the guys at Next Level Games who arranged it for this version were Mike Peacock, Darren Ratke, and Chad York. Pete says this game did a great job of modernizing the original theme, which he says not only makes a great workout song, but could loop in his head forever and he'd be fine with it. I am also partial to this classic upgrade. The next game on our list, Hoff's 8th pick, was a little bit difficult for me, because we just played this soundtrack. Like, the whole soundtrack. Um, for Mega Man 2, I was left with Dr. Wily Stage 2. 
Like everything else in the game, this was composed by Takashi Tateshi. The game was released in 1988 by Capcom for the NES, as we talked about ad nauseum last week. So for now, let's get into just a little bit of this slightly obscure, but still really great, uh, really great composition for Mega Man 2. Once again, this is Wily Castle Stage 2. Yeah, probably the shortest track of the night. Um, if I were going to pick a single song from this game, I don't know. I might go with Air Man or Bubble Man um, or just the Wiley 2 track. There's some really, really great music on this. Yeah, so what do you think about this one? Eh, I thought <laughs> we were only allowed to play very good music. Hey, this is still very good. I mean, the modulation, it's simple. But it's effective for what it does. Um, do you remember this level? Like, isn't this the one where you're, like, going through and, like... I think this is the one where you're fighting the Robot Masters. Eh, well, it's also one of the normal stages. I thought that they used the Wily Stage 1 music for, like, the first two Wily stages, and that this was actually for Stage 3. But it makes sense for the Robot Master stage, because that one, you're not actually in the main stage very long. And so, this has got that sort of ominous build-up to it. But this isn't about what we give a game that we already spent two episodes on. This is about um, Hoff's thoughts on Mega Man 2. He says this soundtrack defies expectation. With its two layers of sound and construction that seem to go against con conventional musical formulas. This is the one full-length song that we didn't play on our episode. It exemplifies what Hoff is talking about with that sort of unconventional musical style. Um, even though it is one of my least favorite tracks on the OST, I still think it counts as very good music. <laughs> but you and I don't always see eye to eye, as our listeners will hear on our next ep episode, which we have recorded a few weeks ago. <laughs> but we're going to stay with Capcom for Pete's 8th theme. And I could not think of a better time to play this absolute stone-cold VGM classic. It goes with everything. So it might as well go on this podcast. Shukapal, what song am I talking about? Uh, Street Fighter 2, a Stone Cold Classic, goes with everything. Uh, Guile scene. There you go. <laughs> and Sonic Boom! We know it's a classic. We know a lot of people love it. Shugapau, can you tell me, do you agree that this is very good music? Yes. What is it about it that you like? Do you have a favorite part of it? or It's just good. <laughs> it is just good. Do you remember who the composer is for Street Fighter 2? Yoko Shimomura. Very good, my son. Very, very good. This was 
released on so many platforms. Uh, I played the SNES version, because this is for the Power Pros, after all. Um, it was released in 1991, originally, once again, by Capcom. Pete says, every single track in Street Fighter 2 is about as perfectly themed as it gets. Hoff agrees, and so do I. Not everybody does, but I do. I think they're all great, they're all fantastic. Guile was my favorite character to play as growing up. My defensive strategy was to duck block in a corner, let loose with a sonic boom or a flash kick whenever anybody was vulnerable. <laughs> It was quite the defensive strategy. I think it, that's actually called turtling <laughs> nowadays, but... Um, uh, like I said, his theme is also a Stone Cold classic that we haven't played yet, so I figured, why not? Okay, next, we're going to go to our last two songs from the NES. Hoff's number two, which was his ninth pick of the night, is from Ninja Gaiden. This game is so frustratingly hard. <laughs> it's so hard. I never really enjoyed it that much, but there's no denying it has earned its place in the Pantheon. And Ryu Hayabusa from Ninja Gaiden is another one who I would... I, I think it'd be really cool to see him in Smash. Uh, this is the song that plays in Act 5, Part 1. And I did not find out until tonight, when I was collecting the music, that the actual name of this theme apparently is Prison of the Dead. Which is just... awesome. <laughs> it's just really cool. But, we'll let y'all listen to the song, then we'll come back and hear what Hoff had to say about it. That is some final area goodness right there. <laughs> what did you think about the song, Shukapal? It was very good music. <laughs> was there a certain part of it that stuck out to you, like one you think you'll be humming later? Um, I mean, just the basic mel melody, I guess. That opening part is what I really thought of as like final area. That yeah, I like that part. That actually, when you speed it up a little bit, it could almost be like an RPG battle theme. <laughs> Everything goes back to Final Fantasy with you these days. It's your obsession of the moment. Um, Ninja Gaiden was published by Tecmo was originally released for the arcade in 1988, and the NES in 1988 in Japan, and 89 in the States. Hoff says that this game was probably the first soundtrack that really made him take notice of just how good game music could be. He said he would turn on the sound test, which the fact that there was a sound test shows that even the developers of this game knew that they had something special on their hands. But he would just rock out to the music in the background. He specifically mentions the per the pounding percussion beats, which I thought that this song showcased pretty well. The composers for Ninja Gaiden were Keiji Yamagishi and Ryuichi Nita, and this was, if it wasn't obvious, from the NES version. And like I said, our second in this last pair of NES games was Pete's number two, his ninth pick of the night, and it is from... Another Koji Kondo classic, the soundtrack for Super Mario Bros. 2. For Pete, Super Mario Bros. 2 has a really funky vibe. He says all the Mario games have great soundtracks, but this one stands out to him. Um, and they talked a little bit about that, and how some people seem to sort of disregard this soundtrack. I don't really understand that, because I, I love it. I love it so much. It is obviously different, because... As you know, this was not originally a Mario game. Um, I think that's kind of common knowledge now in a lot of video game circles. Uh, but it was kind of given a Mario skin and released as Mario 2 in the U.S. because the Mario 2 that came out with in Japan, they thought would be too hard for us Americans. <laughs> 
but we get another Mario soundtrack out of it, so I'm all good. And Hoff mentioned absolutely loving the battle theme against Wart. And it's also one of my favorites. So, here it is. Another fairly short loop, which is going to make for, you know, a nice streamed line episode this evening, juxtaposed with some of the longer tracks, like that Metroid piece we did, and, like, the next one we're going to play. <laughs> Battle with Wart. I remember the first time I got to Wart in Mario 2, and I didn't hear the regular boss music, and I heard this. This is a pretty terrifying song. <laughs> I mean, you're fighting this giant... I don't know if he's really supposed to be a frog or if he's supposed to be a kappa. I think he's a frog. Um, but, you know, he's like this sleep demon who hates vegetables. <laughs> and, uh, man, this game is so much fun. The music is really good. And, uh, yeah, Battle Against Sport is a nice choice. Once again, this was composed by Koji Kondo. Even the original, Doki Doki Panic, was composed by Koji Kondo. This was released by... Nintendo for the NES in 1988. And now we are up to the guys. They didn't really rank them, so I say like number one, but these were really kind of listed in no particular order. But uh, the last two songs or soundtracks that they featured were both SNES classic games. And it's funny, a lot of the SNES games I've mentioned, I've called them classics, and almost all of them. Well, not all of them, a lot of them. There actually are some glaring omissions. But a lot of them are on the SNES Classic. <laughs> uh, a Link to the Past, uh, Final Fantasy VI, uh, Street Fighter II, although it's actually Street Fighter II Turbo. And um, this one, they are all on the SNES Classic, as well as the last game that we're playing of the night. Pete's last pick of the night. I'm going out of order here. No, I'm not. Sorry, rewind. <laughs> Hoff's last pick of the night is from Super Castlevania 4. You and I both know that Castlevania has some fantastic music. Basically, Hoff says, all of the Castlevania games had great soundtracks. This one, though, completely surpassed its 8-bit predecessors with its gothic organ sounds. Hoff enjoys Simon's theme and how it's incorporated into the final battle. This is the other part of that final battle, which is also fantastic. From Super Castlevania 4, this is Dracula Battle.
We open the night with a really cinematic sounding classic from a, a sometimes gothic horror sort of tinged SNES game. That was an early one though, and this was a little bit of a later one. A gothic horror classic Super Castlevania 4. This was Dracula Battle. And you and I were talking about it, Shuka Pao. This doesn't really sound a lot like a final battle theme. It sounds a little bit more to me like a cutscene, but it's, it's super good. Do you think it would be scarier to fight a big, scary final boss with this music or with one of the more, like, rousing, rocking tunes? Mm. I mean, it, it sort of feels more natural with those sort of JRPG-esque type. Big, rocking final battle themes? Yeah. So. So, but since this game is going for, like, that more unsettling feeling, do you think that this might actually be more a little more effective? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, probably. I like how it, it's got that sort of rock guitar driving the, the melody, but you've also got the strings, so it's cool. Cool little juxtaposition there. Um, Castlevania 4, Super Castlevania 4, I'm sorry, was released for the Super NES, and it is the last of many Konami tracks that Pete, not Pete, that Hoff brought to the show. It was composed by Masanori Adachi and Taro Kudo, and it was released in 1991. Well, Shukapau, this has been a fun little bonus episode. It's been nice to get back in the podcasting chair after our break. <laughs> and um, sorry, everybody, it took a little bit longer than we expected because I um, had a external, external hard drive fry on me, and I had to kind of take care of some of that stuff because I use that to help me record. And, yeah, um, that's kind of what happened. So, anyway, we're back. You'll be listening to the first episode of our second season on the second Tuesday in September, which is the 8th, um, one week from, well, hopefully yesterday, as of the time that this drops. I'm hoping to get this out on Wednesday the 2nd. Um, if I can get it edited fast enough. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, it's going to be a fun one. And we're also going to be showing off our new theme song, which was composed by Skeletroy, who I mentioned in, I think, either the last episode or the second to last episode, part one or part two of episode 12, um, as a great... BGM Arranger. Oh yeah, we talked about him because he's one of the folks who filled out the poll. Um, that's where he came into play on the podcast. But anyway, um, I liked a lot of his work so much that I actually commissioned him to make a theme song for us. And after some back and forth and a really, really fun collaboration, we finally got it and we cannot wait for y'all to hear it. So the opening tune that y'all hear on the first episode of Season 2 will be our brand new Very Good Music BGM Podcast theme song. But tonight is not about Very Good Music of EGM Podcast. It is about the late, great Power Pros podcast. Hoff and Pete, I want to say just at the end here, thank you for all the fantastic episodes and all the great times. Y'all made a long and tedious commute to work a little bit more bearable each week, or sometimes every other week, depending on how busy you were. <laughs> And I appreciate you all very much. We're going to close out the episode with a dramatic reading. But before we do that, I'm going to introduce the song that we'll play at the end of that dramatic reading. The last soundtrack that Pete brought to the show is also the last one, and the fourth one that I promised, composed by the Nintendo great Koji Kondo. The soundtrack is from Super Mario World, which was a launch title for the SNES in 1990 in Japan and 1991 in the States, published, of course, by Nintendo. Pete says the whole soundtrack is great and lighthearted until you get to the foreboding castle, and I totally agree. I love how Koji Kondo took a single theme and used variations of it for almost all the music of the game. My favorite rendition of that theme is the underwater level tune, which has been transformed into a waltz, per Mario tradition. You know, because all the underwater themes are waltzes in Mario. <laughs> However, 
I'm not playing a rendition of that motif that Koji Kondo used in this game, because I can't think of a more perfect way to see the pros off than with one of my very favorite video game ending themes. So after our dramatic reading, and the reason we're doing a dramatic reading is because Hoff did one at the end of every episode, and it, it was just a fantastic tradition that I would like to give an homage to. But after you hear this bonus episode Power Pros Tribute dramatic reading, we will play you out with the ending theme from Super Mario World. Remember, everybody, that you can find us on YouTube, on your favorite podcatcher, and now also on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash VGM Please check us out. If you enjoy the show and like what we're doing here, feel free to send us a dollar or two a month. We would be so grateful for any support that you can give. We would also love it if you would like and subscribe on YouTube and um, give us a rating and a review if you want on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or Google or Spreaker or whatever you happen to listen to. Um, we just love the attention. We like it a lot. Come on, my son is a teenager. He needs all the validation he can get. Pretty soon i got to put him through college. And nah, I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to beg. But... If we have brought you guys a fraction of the joy that the Power Pros brought me, then you're welcome, and we love having you along for the ride. Pete and Hoff, one more time, thanks so much. And before we play out with the Super Mario World ending theme, there is still time for one more thing, and that is a dramatic reading. Which will be the blurb from the Power Pros website on podbeam.com. Power Pros is a Nintendo-focused podcast established by video game enthusiasts The Hoff, Chris Hoffman, a seven-year veteran Nintendo Power Editor, and former Nintendo Power Editor-in-Chief Chris Slate. After Slate was launched into space in early 2016, Hoff was joined by a rotating group of guest co-hosts, many also former Nintendo Power contributors, until a fellow former Nintendo Power staffer and Hoff's nemesis, Pete Mashad took over the role on a regular basis. Together, they'll bring you the latest news and opinions on all manner of happenings in the world of Nintendo, from new hardware rumors to impressions on the latest titles and beloved series like Super Mario Bros., Metroid, Donkey Kong, and Fire Emblem. Hoff counts The Legend of Zelda, Mega Man, and Ace Attorney among his top series, alongside a myriad of RPGs. And prior to writing for Nintendo Power, he worked at publications like Play and Gamers Republic, as well as fan-favorite publisher, Working Designs. As of episode 200, released June 20th, 2020, the podcast is on hiatus. Until next time... I'm Bed Ross. And I'm Shoot Kapow. Play very good games, be very good people, and keep listening to very good music. We'll see you next week.